Okay, so thanks, Erlen, um, and thanks everybody. Um, I'm Paolo Ruggeri, third year PhD student from University of L'Aquila. I'll try to discuss a bit uh, how teleconnection between, teleconnections between the Arctic and the mid-latitude work. So I would like to, so we had a nice review of teleconnections by after uh, yesterday, I think, but I'd like to point out how teleconnections between the Arctic and the mid-latitude are summarized in this recent review, Overland et al. So they say that remote forcing, that, that is changes outside the mid-latitude, remote in space and perhaps in times, can influence the mid-latitude circulation through linear and nonlinear atmospheric patterns known as teleconnections. So what I'll try to discuss in this talk is basically how I will focus on ice variability, but I will, how high latitude forcing can interact with the mid latitude atmosphere. I will focus mostly on winter, autumn, winter, and the North Atlantic as barren scarce sea ice, and I will try to emphasize a bit also the role of the stratosphere. So, um, I'll give a very short introduction, then I will show an experiment from a speedy, as a result from a speedy experiment. And then I'll talk a bit, perhaps, about the uh, simple setup in speed and simple climate experiment that we uh, recently did. So one reason why there's a lot of interest on the Arctic at the moment is that Arctic amplification, that is the rapid warming of the Arctic regions that has been observed recently, has drawn attention on the processes that are going on in the Arctic. So sea ice losses is very important role in the conjecture of the Arctic amplification feedback. But the interaction of the mid-latitude jet with the, in general, with high latitude forcing, so high latitude surf surface fluxes is not well understood, that, and that makes essentially the link with mid-latitude un uncertain. So what we, one of the uh, prominent patterns of mid-latitude weather that has been observed associated with <coughs> Arctic amplification is the warm, the so-called warm Arctic cold continent pattern, which essentially says that when the Arctic is warm, the continents are cold. So it, it can be a proper de definition of the warm Arctic cold continent pattern that probably does not exist yet, but it can be identified in many ways in observation and reanalysis. It, it also turns out that if you look simply at the difference between the low level temperature in late winter uh, in the last decade compared to the rest of era interim, for example, what you see is a very strong uh, Arctic warming signal with the cooling over the continents. This is true for late winter, but this is, if you look only at December, for example, what you see is a very strong signal over Barents, the Barents and Cara region, which is a region that is being studied a lot at the moment, with probably some cooling over Siberia. Now, one point is that models seems to do not reproduce this pattern associated to uh, surface forcing in the Arctic region. And that is more or less what I try to discuss. It's also worth to point out that there's a lot, at least in observations and analysis, there's a lot of intraseasonal variability in these recent winters. So it's fair to say that in early winter and in late autumn, the signal is confined in the Arctic mostly. But then the evolution seems to point out that there's some interaction with the middle latitude. And it happens that in, in these recent years, we also had a very strong and clear signal in the stratosphere, it seems to point at the uh, warming in the lower stratosphere, essentially. So the reason why we, we need a lot of effort to understand how this connection works is probably that, uh, as has been pointed out again in this recent paper, the interaction is essentially nonlinear and state dependent, the response of the atmosphere to uh, surface forcing in the Arctic is nonlinear state dependent. So somehow we need complexity in models to 
understand how the interaction works in the real world. So we need, because we need to represent in the model essentially the real state of the atmosphere. So ultimately, we need to use realistic models. But on the other hand, we also need simplicity because uh, state-of-the-art models essentially disagrees. So recently, this authors pointed out that the state-of-the-art AGCMs that were forced with identical CI loss produce significantly different circulation responses. And none of them was able to reproduce the, essentially the negative article oscillation response that has been found by many model, many model experiments. On the other hand, simple models are able to show the weakening and the equator was shift of the jet stream that can also be uh, used to understand why the warm article continent patterns arises. So uh, one reason why we need complexity is also that many, at this, at this stage, it seems that the community has, has not identified the precise mechanism for this interaction and essentially all the components that are important for mid-latitude weather seems to be involved. So, but the basic idea that I'm trying to simplify and summarize a lot from uh, this paper Cohen is that when you warm the Arctic, essentially you change the equator to pole temperature gradient, but you also induce a direct interaction with a low level and eddy driven jet. And these changes in the jet eventually can affect the circulation in the stratosphere, which can then propagate downward the signal and give a delayed response. So this, these are more or less the ingredients of what I'm going to say and show uh, in this talk. So I guess you more or less you all know Speedy at the moment, so I don't want to talk a lot about this, but uh, we are using the full model, a T30, uh, uh, only AGCM, so we prescribe SST essentially. Um, what we do is to uh, make an ensemble of short runs. So we produce initial condition from a long run with climatological surface force uh, conditions. Then we produce short runs, one with climatological sea ice cover, and one where we reduce the sea ice cover in Barents and Cara. But we only apply this forcing for a very short time. Only for t we made two experiments, one where the forcing persists for two weeks and one where it, where it persists for six weeks. And we start the simulation in midwinter in January the 1st. So what we see in the response is that in the first two or three weeks, uh, here we see temperature in colors and zonal wind in, con wind in contours. Um, essentially, in the first two or three weeks, the response is shallow, is confined in the Arctic, and is essentially uh, linear and thermodynamic. I think Tido will uh, talk uh, more about this later this morning. But it's interesting to see that after a while, we observe the equator was shift of the jet. We also see that the warming is in the troposphere is still shallow and confined somehow, but the warming is found also in the lower stratosphere of speedy. And it actually persists until uh, the end of February, more or less. And this, the signal is dominated by the stratosphere warming. So if we look what's going on in the area where we are warming the system, so here we see the 300 hectopascal zonal wind in colors and transient heat fluxes in so V prime T prime essentially in uh, shadings. So as I said, in, at the beginning, the response is, is essentially confined in the surroundings of the heating region. It's essentially linear and it's a, in thermodyn it's a heat flow. Then after a while, you see that the zone, of the, the jet in the mid-latitude is perturbed. Somehow eddies tend to compensate the heating in the warming area, but also the, the, this is an indication of a reduction of eddy activity in the region associated with the North Atlantic storm tracks. 
Then in February, which is the last plot that we see here, uh, the signal is essentially confined in the North Atlantic where it persists for a while, and it, it's basically a negative NAO. So this, we think that the, we can separate the response in a range of two months, essentially, into a direct and linear one, a large-scale response, which is somehow confined in the troposphere, and a delayed response where we think the stratosphere is important. So to look and to, exp and to explain why we see essentially the strongest response when the forcing is, uh, is not active anymore, here we quantify the uh, impact of the anomalous tropospheric circulation on the stratosphere. And I don't want to go a lot into the details of this, but essentially what we, what we did is to quantify. Um, so this is V star, T star. It's the eddy heat flux explained by anomalous waves. Um, and we try to quantify from uh, how the stratosphere is perturbed. And the only thing that I want to point out here is that <laughs> if you separate this into components like an, an, of anomalous temperatures and, and climatological velocity and vice versa, assuming that nonlinear terms are not important, and indeed they are important, but anyway. Uh, so what you see is, is that this link can be explained by a linear uh, interaction of anomalous waves climatological waves, which is something that has been speculated and pointed out quite often in literature recently. I just want to point this out because if you look at the red line, which is the, the interaction of anomalous temperature and climatological wind, essentially, the signal that you find there is, um, is associated to uh, so the, the, the result that you get here is consistent with a perturbation in the circulation in the Barents and Kara seas. So studies that look at how the, for example, blocking in high latitudes uh, can perturb the stratosphere have also found this result without perturbing sea ice, simply looking at how is the circulation when, uh, when there's a blocking in those regions. So the perspective that I'd like to point out that it seems that uh, our response is both tropospheric and stratospheric. Uh, so what I did here is to regress the signal onto the anomalous heat flux that we have just seen before, and to look at the lagged relationships. So the dashed line that you see here is essentially the heat flux, while the black line is the uh, two potential lags in the uh, 30 hectopascal. And the blue line is geopotential light in the, trop in the upper troposphere over the North, the North Atlantic, while the red one is over Barents and Cara. So what you see essentially is that as soon as you have a burst of heat flux, the stratosphere is perturbed. But this burst of heat flux, heat flux is preceded by a signal in the troposphere, which is in the North Atlantic and in Barents and Cara, and which looks like this one. But after a while, you find the signal again in the North Atlantic. So the picture that we get, although we are, we are mixing forced and internal variability, the picture that we get is that if you get this response in your model, then, then you expect to see a perturbation in the stratosphere and also a delayed response afterwards. So the crucial thing here is whether you get this or not, essentially, because this is a deep response in the, in the troposphere. Indeed, well, this is a simple model with a simple uh, with a stratosphere and not many vertical levels. But it seems that uh, this, essentially, we find a, a leg relationship, a leg teleconnection between uh, barons Kara CIs and a negative NAO, so uh, 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 an equator was shift of the jet in the North Atlantic, if you want. It seems that state-of-the-art models are able to reproduce this teleconnection. So this uh, results uh, from a paper written by Javier uh, Garcia Serrano et al. recently. And 
they looked at CMIP models and they made a statistical analysis to uh, see whether they can find statistically significant teleconnections between the Arctic and the North Atlantic. And it seems that they find, so what you see here is a collection of these uh, links in these models and these points here indicate the stratospheric pathway. So it seems that this kind of interaction can explain the connection that is found in state-of-the-art models. So one could say that, well, if I, that the linear response is essentially not really active to perturb the state in the mid-latitude, that most of, of the response that we have seen is explained by the late response zone, also by the stratosphere. But that the key to understand whether this connection is real or not is to understand what happens in, in the troposphere and to understand whether your forcing is able to perturb and to change the chat. And people are trying to understand this because as I pointed out previously, it's the, the spread of the response that we get in models seems to indicate clearly that it's hard to uh, determine whether this uh, equator was shift of the jet in response to sea ice reduction is real or not. And recently people at the UK Met Office tried to propose a constraint to somehow classify and understand model behavior. So what they did is to, uh, so they, they approached the problem with a, a, a AMIP-like uh, uh, experiment where they essentially perturb sea ice in the Arctic everywhere almost on the Arctic age, on the ice age, sorry. Uh, so then, then they look essentially at the atmospheric response to uh, ice loss in a similar way to what we have done with Speedy. But what they get, what you see here is the response in the Amy run, which is, so this is the jet in the no response in the North Atlantic at high latitude, between 50 and 65 or something like that. So what they get is essentially a positive, a, weak, a weekly positive NAO response. Interestingly, if they use the, the coupled model, they get a negative NAO response. And what they argue that, well, maybe it's coupling that is important, or maybe it's the background state of the model that is important. And what they find that if they simply change the sea surface temperature of the the climatological sea surface temperature of the atmospheric model, and they replace them with the equilibrium, the average sea surface temperatures in the coupled model, they get, again, the negative NAO response. So what you see here is essentially how one can infer the relationship between the response in the jet and the state of the system. So they are trying, actually, to quantify the state dependence of the response. Observations lie here. The one may be tempted to say, well, basically models that gives you the equator was shift are wrong. Because observation stays closer to the, to the thermodynamic response, which is small and it's not an equator was shift. But one thing that they have also pointed out in their paper amongst many, amongst many interesting things is that it's not really the position of the jet that is important to get that response. It's more how the model propagates waves in the troposphere, essentially. So they look, I don't want to go very much into this uh, plot here, but what they look is that is the difference between the climatological refractive index between high latitude and mid latitude. And essentially what they say, well, it's not really the, pos the relative position of the jet and the forcing that is important. What is important is where the model is able to propagate waves. So if the waves, goes, uh, if waves go more equatorward, essentially you won't get this, this response. Why, what, anyway, what we're trying to do in this is to try to understand how the position of the 
uh, of the jet in your system determines the re determines the response to the ice forcing. So we we think that these two points of view are not completely independent. They're not completely separated because the preferred propagation direction of propagation of waves also depends, or at least they are all, they are not two independent measures of your of your system. So. And indeed, if you think about it, so what I'm showing here is just the, the average of the zone of wind from area interim at 300 and 850. If you think about it, surface forcing comes from many regions at many different latitudes and different longitudes. Some are upstream with respect to the North Atlantic jet. Some are downstream. Some are far. Some are, are in the Pacific. One could argue also that no cover represent an important forcing which is in the middle of of the continent so what we designed an experiment with a simple uh, climate i think many of you have seen the poster that emanuele presented on monday where he is trying to reproduce the same setup in open ifs uh, this is also the idealized speedy setup that we have seen before i think in the stone tracks though so what we do is so you should, uh, the idea is to introduce a thermal forcing in the system. So we use speedy dynamical core in aqua planet coupled to a uh, slab ocean, and we change the Q-flex in the slab ocean to warm an area in the mid latitude. And then we perturb the high latitude that introducing small and weaker forcings that should resemble the effect of sea ice loss on the ice age or warmer sea surface temperatures or uh, any surface forcing. So the system essentially, I think Lenka probably will show some results about this, but essentially it, it, introducing this triangle, we tilt the jet, we perturb the jet, and we create a wave number one structure in the, in the, strat in the troposphere. And one advantage of this is that you get, also get rid of the stratospheric signal because there are no, there are, a, a, with the triangle we introduce stationary waves, but it turns out that they are not able to interact efficiently with the forcing and to propagate the signal in the stratosphere. So a second advantage of that is that you are not really perturbing the stratosphere, so whatever happens is happening really due to the interaction of the jet. And we repeat a similar experiment, a couple of similar experiments. So again, a long run, we skip 20 years just to pick initial conditions from an equilibrated distribution, and then we impose a localized forcing that is something like what we have seen before here. So a forcing in a latitudinal band of 15 degrees, more or less, and a longitudinal band of 50 degrees or something. And then we prescribe a forcing which is zonally symmetric, but at the, and over the polar cap up to the lower boundary of this localized forcing. So we introduce the same amount of heat into the atmosphere, essentially. And we are studying sensitivity to many aspects, actually. I will only show results for longitudinal and meridional position, but I will, we have also seen how the magnitude of the heating affects the response, the temporal evolution of the response. And we plan to also to change slightly the climate, the simple climate of our system, maybe using a smaller thermal forcing in the Q flux. But unfortunately, the results are not ready yet. That would be an interesting experiment, and it would be directly comparable with what people at the Met Office have done. So what I show here is the latitude of the upper level jet in this diagram. Uh, so the y-axis is uh, the latitude of the upper level jet minus the zonal mean. This is the or more or less the position of the triangle. And on this axis, somehow I have longitude, but I'm plotting the number of the experiments that I use to label the experiments, which means that at every point here, I show results from a different experiment. So 
if we look at this plot now, experiment four is performed using the simple system with the triangle in the middle latitude and a high latitude forcing, which is at 10 degrees, so upstream with respect to the triangle, while experiment eight <coughs> is equivalent to experiment four, but the forcing is downstream at 210. So what you see on the right side of, uh, on the right diagram, is a collection of uh, points coming from 24 different experiments. Each point there is the ensemble mean of, of uh, 50 years of experiment. And we look essentially at the same quantity that has been defined here to investigate the response. But it's, we are, we, so here it is high latitude to the upper level winds in the North Atlantic, while here in our experiment we use the zonal mean for probably obvious reasons, not obvious, but anyway. And then we are, I have three lines because I have used eight longitudes and three different latitudes. So the red one is high latitude, probably close to where more or less sea ice varies in the real world, while the, the green one and the red one are slightly more uh, equator world. So the interesting features of this response are that if you're upstream, the response is very weak. So I, we, here we see the response after one year of integration. So it, the system had a lot of time to equilibrate. So essentially, we're looking at, uh, at the steady response, if you want. Then there's a sharp transition as we move downstream. One could say that if you are downstream, the response is more efficient, is stronger. But the most interesting part is that when you get to these regions, not only you can have the strongest response in your system, but there's also an enormous variability between, with respect to a small change in the latitude of the forcing. So if I make an experiment, this would be Barents and Cara, by the way. So if the triangle is the Gulf Stream, then this is Barents and Cara. So imagine that this simple system could be used to explain what happens in the real interaction between Barents and Cara and the North Atlantic. If I put my forcing here, I would say, well, there's a strong dynamical response in a crater we shift. If I put my forcing here at 50, 70, I would say, well, that's not a big response, and probably I will find that the thermodynamic response is dominant in that case. So what I'm doing now is to average these regions that seems to have a similar behavior. So I'm averaging over longitude, essentially. So I will call this region downstream, this one midstream, and this one upstream. And now we compare results with the zonally symmetric forcing experiment. And now we want to show the time series of this index so that you get sort of idea of how the response evolves. So I keep using red to indicate high latitude forcing. But, uh, so we use red for this line essentially where I will not separate the other lines. And what you see is that it doesn't really matter if your forcing is localized or if it's zonally symmetric and if it's spread everywhere over the polar cap, as long as you are away from, this two, from the barons Cara region in our simple model. So if I put the heating more or less where the storm tracks are induced, so more or less over the triangle, or I put it everywhere in the polar cap, it doesn't make much difference. But if I put it down, far downstream, in more or less in the region of the uh, barons Cara and Siberian seas, I can get a very strong, stronger response. And indeed, if now, if now I average over, so now I have average over longitude, if I average over latitude, the latitude of the forcing, and I look at the equivalent of an, of an old molar diagram, so we have time here, and the longitude of the forcing here, and again we look at the response compared to uh, a zonally symmetric forcing, what you get is that 
also the response has a wave number one pattern. So if I put a forcing downstream, a localized forcing is more efficient to push the jet equatorward compared to a zonally symmetric forcing. While if I put it upstream, it is less efficient. So there are many aspects that still have to be investigated in these experiments, but, and of course it's a simple system, and I want to just go back quickly to, to what we are doing. So we, we don't have many ingredients of the system, as Franco also pointed out before, maybe wave number one is not enough to uh, capture all the... Yeah. Yeah, we could add another piece. We could also add a continent uh, here, maybe to have a, a, a sharp uh, collapse of the jet. Um, anyway, the, 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 we, one could build complexity, but I think what we're really trying to do in these experiments, and we, we, we should keep it simple because we, at the end we will need to get to, the state, to a state-of-the-art model, so there's no reason to probably add complexity at the moment. What we're really trying to do is to uh, understand why you can have some, uh, there are some positions that somehow are resonant, and why the, the fact that the response is localized in some areas can give you a stronger, a stronger response. So thinking in terms of the equator, the equator, war, the equator to pole gradient controlling this is not enough. So the position of the heating and the response of the troposphere to that may be a wave train, essentially perturbing also the low-level jet and and the eddy feedbacks in the jet it should be taken into account, and that's essentially the message. I hope I'll have more results soon, but I think essentially I can draw some, rather than conclusions, maybe it's more a perspective. So the response to ice loss is both linear and thermodynamic and dynamic, say. And this has been found out probably 10 years ago by early studies done in the United States. But there's also an important component which is driven by the stratosphere. Essentially, if you want to perturb the stratosphere, you need a deep response in the troposphere. And we've seen that it's not clear how you get the, this deep response in the, strato in the troposphere, and whether it is real or not. It should be also pointed out that it could not be meaningful, because the probe we are using, essentially, we are assuming that we, the system is forced by fluxes in the high latitudes, while instead, the, I would say that the problem is it's intrinsically coupled. So not only you have to be able to respond in the right way to, in the model, in the right way to the forcing, but the model should be able to prescribe the correct forcing. So we also need, ultimately, to know uh, how sea ice variability is controlled by the atmosphere. And while it seems that the community is looking forward to doing more the comp in, uh, intercomparisons and the classification of these response in models, the understanding processes could be actually also uh, important. And I think I'll stop here and just put yeah, the reference. Thank you.